Are you ready to re-enter the Matrix? Today on Patio Commentary, we're going to be diving in to The Matrix Reloaded, a sequel that not only amplified the action, but deepened the enigmatic world that captivated audiences worldwide only a few years prior. So sit back, relax, and let's decode how Reloaded managed to challenge our perceptions, expectations, and proven to be more than just visual spectacles on the silver screen. Here today on Patio Commentary. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to another episode of Patio Commentary. Today, we're going to be talking about The Matrix Reloaded. Obviously, the follow-up, the highly anticipated, I mean, the probably in my expect in my estimation, the most hyped movie of 2003. And there was a lot of good movies in 2003. The first Fire Pirates of the Caribbean movie opened a couple months later. Finding Nemo opened uh, not long after The Matrix Reloaded. Terminator 3 came out that year. There was a lot of big movies that came out in the year of 2003, including The Matrix Revolutions, the conclusion to The Matrix Trilogy, which we'll be diving into later on this week. But Reloaded was its own little beast. You know, as I mentioned before, when I saw the original Matrix movie back when I was 17, it blew my mind in regards to just like how it handled action, the, the lobby shootout scene, all of that stuff blew my 17 year old brain to bits. But now I'm 21. I've grown. I've gone at, I've gone through high school. I've gone into college. You know, I'm able to drink legally and the matrix now was something that I could probably understand a little bit better. But then again, I also wasn't thinking about it through a philosophical lens. And I'll tell you this, after watching the movie again last night, I definitely wasn't looking at it through the lens of how fucking horny that movie is. My God, it's horny. The Wachowskis, something was going on. Something was cooking with them on that particular front because that mo we'll talk about it, but that movie was horny as hell. And if you look very closely, if you pause your 4K disc at just the right moment in time, you can see that Monica Bellucci was not wearing underwear and a very visible bush is there. I'm just, I'm just pointing that out for historical reference. Okay. Not for you to Google, although maybe pause this, Google it, come back, but still the movie's horny as hell, but we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. When I saw this movie for the first time, I think the way to the best describe it was I was in Los Angeles for E3 2003. I was staying in Burbank at a friend's house and we decided to go check out the 10 PM early screening of the matrix. This was massive because every single screen at this theater was showing this movie at 10 PM and it was packed. And I mean, packed solid. Every single showing was sold out. People were absolutely hyped to watch this movie. And when it ended, I think a lot of people were kind of conflicted. Some were confused. Some applauded. But we also didn't know where the story was going because this movie, if anything, is about deconstruction. And so the first movie largely follows the hero's journey, right? Think of Neo as being kind of similar to like, let's say Luke Skywalker, as I mentioned before, very Joseph Campbell in its approach. But with this movie, it's about undermining everything we learned from the last movie. And I think that really angered some people. But here it is 20 years later, and I'm rewatching the movie now as a middle-aged man with children and a lot more life experience. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of get it. I kind of get what they were going for, which is one of the reasons why I'm anxious to dive into Revolutions, because I feel like the conclusion of that is going to be a very interesting discussion overall. But before we dive into all of that, I do want to remind you guys of what The Matrix Reloaded is about. So let me just give you a quick brief synopsis. The Matrix Reloaded thrusts us back into the dystopian world where reality is a digital illusion and machines still control humanity. Our hero Neo, now fully embracing his role as the One, dives deeper into the Matrix, armed with extraordinary powers and a growing understanding of the system's intricacies. Alongside him are the Steadfast Trinity and the Wise Morpheus, each grappling with the weight of an impending war. 
As the machine army closes in on the last human city of Zion, Neo seeks answers from the Oracle, a prophetic figure within the Matrix. Her cryptic guidance leads him on a perilous journey through a labyrinth of truth and deception. Meanwhile, Zion braces for the onslaught with its inhabitants torn between despair and hope. The movie really is about despair and hope. It is about control and choice. The movie asks a lot of those kind of questions. It really does make you start to think, well, what exactly are you able to do? How much choice do we have versus what could be described as predetermined fate? And that's a lot of how the movie kind of puts itself together. But what boggles my mind is that there's not a lot of information known about how the Wachowskis developed this particular story and that of revolutions, right? We don't really know what it is that they were thinking about. We can only look at the finished product. And even 20 years later, they've been very cagey about giving us any behind the scenes information about their philosophy of making it. Sure, there's been a tidbit here and a tidbit there. But I think a lot of it is largely left open to interpretation. That can be good or bad, depending on who you talk to. The movie itself obviously was going to happen. There's no way to look at the success of The Matrix. You know, a $60 million movie grossing over $460 million worldwide, never mind all of its home video sales, at a time when the regular MSRP price for a VHS tape was $99.99. And of course, the invent... And the proliferation of DVDs entering into the home marketplace and how much money that was. I mean, Warner's was making money hand over fist with The Matrix. So it absolutely makes sense that they would want to come back to the table and do more. So they gave the Wachowskis, I think, free reign. Quite literally, do what you want. It worked the last time. Let's just make it work this time. Now, the last time they had Joel Silver... And I think he had a lot more influence on making that more of a palatable, crowd-pleasing adventure. Here, you could tell the Wachowskis had more control, and they wanted to dive more into philosophy rather than anything else. But I think that's how you expand the concept of what the Matrix is. You have to dive in to these specific conversations and, and, and these little inklings of of whether or not you have control or you don't because neo is grappling with that the entirety of the movie he, yes he's embraced being the one but he doesn't fully understand what that is he doesn't understand what his purpose is in fact that's actually probably the biggest idea of what the movie conveys so with the return of agent smith now broken free of the matrix so he himself has kind of become red-pilled, all things considered. He now wants to establish control. And the reason for this is because what is the primary purpose of his programming once he's been, you could say, named obsolete, deemed obsolete, or just simply he's run his course? Well, that's one of the things that the Matrix allows for, is it allows for these programs to have choice. Their overall programming says, you should be deleted because you are no longer necessary to the grand scheme of things. But these operations, these programs, have the opportunity to choose to stay within the matrix and to avoid detection, therefore to avoid deletion. And there's a lot, there's a lot of like juxtaposition between the humans and at least, you know, Neo and Agent Smith, right? They're yin and they're yang. And there's actually an interesting shot when you have the burly brawl take place in the uh in the the playground. The basketball court, you know, uh, in the middle of the movie when Neo is fighting all of those agents. And there's this shot where they're kind of all running out from like the, the top and the bottom of the scene. And when they're doing that, I'm watching this and it looks almost like a, like a yin and yang. And I know there's a lot of like philosophy that went into this movie. And I'm trying to argue, I was trying to grapple with that as I'm watching the scene because I'm like, there's clearly the symbolism here is, is, you know, light and dark, right? Good and evil. That you know, that particular di dichotomy. But I, I, I think it was, it was a nice sim symbolic thing, but I can't quite figure out exactly what it means. Maybe someone out there can enlighten me on it. Something that I just noticed. Maybe you've noticed it. Maybe you'll notice it next time you watch it. But the movie really does start to talk to you about 
what is predetermined versus anything else. And I know I've brought that up multiple times, but again, this movie kind of hammers you over the head with it. It really does deconstruct the idea of the original film. Because remember, Neo believes that he is the one because Morpheus believed that he is the one. Trinity believed that he is the one because Morpheus believed that he is the one. And they also believe the Oracle, who we now find out is largely a program that was designed to determine whether or not humans would become aware of the Matrix and what their response to that would be. And so it's really fascinating. <laughs> Like how the movie itself is trying to grapple with all of these things while still having mind bending special effects and really amazing action. But that's actually one of the things I want to touch upon real quick, because the, the, the idea here about the action, because they use a lot of wire fighting in the first movie, this movie, the way that it's shot, the way that I'm sure even revolutions is shot when it comes to the hand to hand combat is slow by today's comparison. It's not that the actors themselves are responding slower in the fight, and maybe they are, but it's also the way that it's choreographed. It's meant to showcase all the action and not cut around it. Whereas modern fights like that would probably have a lot of sound effects, a lot of quick cuts and things like that in order to create a more visceral, exciting experience. Here, watching it again 20 years later, I'm like, it's a little bit on the slow side. It's a little bit on the cinematic, the, the operatic scale. And that actually leads me to a very interesting thought that I had about this movie where right off the bat, it goes into full blown fantasy mode. I think we need to, I think we need to understand that about the matrix reloaded and probably even the matrix revolutions. It's a fantasy movie and it really plays that up. It, it, the world building just in the first 20 minutes alone of the matrix reloaded is pretty damn fantastic. Because it starts off talking about the Osiris, which if you've ever seen the final flight of the Osiris, the 13 minute short film that was on the Animatrix, they also played it in theaters. I forget which movie they played it in front of in 2003 leading up to the release of The Matrix Reloaded, but uh, we had it at the drive-in that I worked at and I watched it every single night because I also really like Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, and it was done by the same studio, which is no longer around, unfortunately. But they were clearly setting up that more is going on. Now we're getting like this war. The Sentinels have discovered where Zion is. Now, is that because Cypher had given them information? Is that just because they were able to figure it out? In the beginning of the movie, we don't really know. We don't really know all of this stuff. But by the end of the movie, we find out that they've apparently always known where Zion is. Because they've killed Zion five previous times. So if you go back to the first movie, when Morpheus says, we, you know, we don't know what year it is. We think it's somewhere around 2165, but they don't know how old they are. They don't know what year it is because the Matrix has been telling them through its programming that this is probably about what it is. Why? Because we've gone through five other iterations of the Matrix. And that is the deconstruction of the movie that I think a lot of people really got frustrated with because the first movie sets up, this is a construct. This is a system. The, they need, you know, they need us to survive. We don't need them to be human. We need to take our power back. We need to unplug from the matrix. We need to take the red pill. We need to, to be awoken. This movie is basically like, yeah, no, you've tried all that multiple times. We've realized that they've run into failures. And so they just keep rebooting the system. But at the end of the day, the machines need us and we need the machines. And there's in fact, an entire conversation between a councilman and Neo down in the engineering room of Zion, where they literally explain this. They, they literally explain to you what's going to be revealed in the ending about how there is a symbiotic relationship between the two. Even though it's a war. And even though the machines are the ones that are in charge, it's still a goddamn war. So I always found that to be really fascinating. Because again, back then when you first see it for the first time, you're not thinking about it. You're not too sure what this is alluding to. You can understand the symbolism that they're trying to go for. But all things considered, you're still going like, all right, like, it is what it is. Okay, let's move on. You know, it's a conversation that's probably going to come into play later on. But when he meets the architect and he finds out that 
he is the sixth iteration of the Matrix, and he's been improving upon the Matrix every time he rebuilds it. But there's always still going to be that anomaly. And that anomaly is love. Humans have it, machines don't. That's the anomaly. And so it ultimately creates the one, and they ultimately have to then get the one to the architect in order to choose. Do you choose humanity or do you choose love? And I think up until this point, the, the architect and the oracle maybe didn't realize that Anderson, Neo, had the love in him. He cared more about love than he cared about humanity. Because everyone kept to even, even, um, uh, what was it? Persephone, Monica Bellucci's character. That was a weird scene too. Well, I'm going to get to that. But she is told, you know, Trinity that it's true love, but it's fleeting. Cause she knows, she knows exactly what's happening. She knows what's going to happen once the key master is able to unlock the door to the architect. Cause she's been through it before. And so she's already kind of setting the stage that, you know, this is already something that's going to fall apart. Trinity is going to die. Neo is going to have to make a choice. Because remember, in the first movie, he was told that Morpheus is going to die unless Neo sacrifices himself to save Morpheus. He made that choice, and now he has to understand why he made that choice. And that's a lot of what The Matrix Reloaded kind of leads up to. What I really enjoyed about it was that conversation, albeit a little heavy-handed. You know, the, the architect came across as like a proto redditor. It was just like all these words, like it got to the point of where like, I really wanted to go find the script. I wanted to copy his dialogue. I wanted to throw it in chat GPT and be like, could you just explain this to me? Like I'm five to better understand. Cause it's just a bunch of words. And that I mean, obviously that, you know, he thinks he's smarter than, than he is because up until that point, he's been never been proven wrong. Every other iteration of the one has chosen save Zion, save humanity, take out Zion, choose a few people to rebuild it, allow it to grow again to the point of where it can be cold. That part was a little bit confusing for me. Like if you need humans to stay in the pods, why allow Zion to be rebuilt? I mean, maybe I'm overthinking it or underthinking it, but that, that part was a little confusing to me. It might pop up again in Revolutions. It might. I don't know. Not too sure. To, I, I'm going to watch the movie again tonight so I can have a better understanding of it. But either way, the philosophies contained within are interesting. And Neo, of course, chooses love. He chooses Trinity. Also fully embracing that he is the one doing all of his Superman stuff and having all of that power. Because he does want to change things, but he also wants to save humanity, save who he loves. And fight back against the system. So at the end of the movie, you know, obviously Neo has brought some of those powers out to the real world. Really weird how that whole thing, whatever, you know, sentinels are coming for him. They're going to blow up the Nebuchadnezzar. And then he's able to use like a lightning effect or whatever on them. Now, part of me wonders if his programming in the matrix has allowed him to bring over some of the subconscious, you know, he can feel the sentinels. I don't know. Like they're trying to argue a supernatural element of this. They're trying to argue that the prophecy of the one also kind of applies to like, he's got powers in the real world, i.e. Jesus. It's a little ham-fisted, whatever. It goes a little, like I said, this is a fantasy. This is a fantasy. It goes out, it goes very much into that realm. And so at the end of the movie, now we know, you know, you have Agent Smith who has infected a human who is trying to sabotage things from the inside. He already did sabotage things, therefore allowing the uh, Sentinels to get closer to Zion. But at, at the same time, if the Sentinels already knew where Zion was because they have killed Zion five previous times, it seems rather interesting that we have this other side story going on when they kind of say none of this. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you guys have a deeper meaning of this than I do. And I would like to know your thoughts, honestly. The movie ends, you know, to be concluded, obviously coming out six months after the fact you have Matrix Revolutions. And it's one that even when I saw The Matrix Reloaded for the first time, I was like, hell yeah, man, bring it on. And I watched it a bunch more times at the drive-in. So that was one of the perks of the job. But let's talk about how horny this movie is, because this has been like weighing on my mind since last night. The movie starts off 
you know, and like it's 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 Trinity. Neo's having a dream about her. He wakes up in bed next to her on the Nebuchadnezzar. They, you know, they get back to Zion and he is like, you know, they're making out and they want to have sex, you know, and everything else. And then it's like, they go down to the party and then, you know, you got, you got Morpheus. He's out there. He's not wearing a shirt. He's just got a tank top on. He's got a vest on. Right. So he's got his vest on. He gives this very rousing speech and he's like, 250,000 sentinels are coming to kill us. But tonight, oh, Lordy, tonight, let's make them hear us. And it's like, what, is, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? You want them to hear you? You want them to know where you are? Well, all right, fine. And then everyone's all like, you know, and they all start like grooving and everyone's fucking, it's a, it's an orgy. Let's be fair. Whole thing's an orgy, massive orgy. You see a couple of boobies in the shots as well, you know, and then it cuts to this really like elongated sex scene of, of Trinity and Neo, uh, getting it on. Right. And like to the point of where like they both finish, I think if you're watching, I mean, Neo definitely finishes and then immediately has post nut clarity, which is always funny. But then even after that, when they go to the Merovingian, the Merovingian, who's like my favorite character in the movie tries to establish like cause and effect by sending a horny cake to a blonde woman. And we literally watch this cake, give her an orgasm to the point of where the camera even goes in between her legs in, you know, digital form. And we watch the explosion, you know, skaploosh just, and then she gets up like, well, excuse me, I've got to go. And then he's like, I got to go to the bathroom too. And I'm like, he's going to go have sex with her. And of course he was even indicated later on by his wife. Who's like, I can see her lipstick through the matrix on your dangling there, buddy. Such a weird, horny movie, super horny. Even to, like I said before, at the beginning of this, you can watch it and you can look and see that Monica Bellucci is not wearing underwear. And it's like clear as day. She at, at no point in any of her scenes was she wearing underwear with that latex dress, which makes sense because you would see the outlines, but here you see an entirely different outline. Yeah. I'm a bit of a perv that caught my attention. Plus it's Monica Bellucci, man. Come on, come on, come on. I'm only human. I'm only human. One of the things I really liked was the whole situation involving the, the freeway chase, because what they did is they built a one and a half mile replica of a freeway at an air force base in California on the runways. And they got GM to donate 300 cars that they could destroy in the name of art. And they spent a long time shooting the sequence. And the sequence really is intricate and it really is good. What I find to be really funny, though, is you can tell that the Wachowskis very much try to utilize as much of the roadway as possible. So, like, when the chase scene starts, they're going one direction, right? Like, let's say they're going northbound on the 101, okay? So they're going northbound. And then Trinity and the key maker jump off and land on a Ducati and then they go southbound and then they're being chased by the cops. And then Trinity does a 180 and starts going northbound again. And the whole thing works on just like, uh, you know, a visual aesthetic. Like there's no Neo. This is them versus agents. This is them versus the twins. The scene on, on the bridge when Morpheus pulls out the katana and he cuts across the, the, the SUV or the truck. I think it was a avalanche and he cuts it and it flips. And then he just slowly turns around with the automatic uh, pistol and opens fire on the gas tank. And it just blows up. I legit started giggling. Like I had a huge smile on my face. It was just so cool. I started giggling. I forgot how badass that scene was. And it was great to see Morpheus go toe to toe with an agent go toe to toe with these guys and show that he is a force to be reckoned with. He's not just a philosopher. He's not just a spiritual leader. He's not just like a guru type guy. He can actually hold his own, which was great. And I love that sequence. And of course, then you have, the, you know, right before then there's the fight sequence and like the, uh, the, the archway of the house, the foyer of the house. And that's a lot of wire fighting, very slow, methodical, combat heavy operatic approach to it it was really good it was really good i thought the, the action scenes were great there was some good gunplay there's some good hand-to-hand -hand combat but like i said the editing is a little bit slow 
And that's something that, well, unfortunately, was maybe a byproduct of the time or just a choice made by everyone involved. They wanted to show the action very much like Chinese cinema shows the action. But the problem, though, is that American audiences are very much, uh, you know, we're attuned to something wholly different. And that's the unfortunate side of all of this. But man, at the end of the movie, I walked out of that movie last night and I was excited to continue watching the series. I was really excited to dive back in to Revolutions. I almost started it up right away. I almost dove right back into it right away in order to continue the story because when I saw it 20 years ago, I liked it. But there are elements of it. There are fundamental things about the philosophy that I didn't get. And I understand that I think a lot of the audiences are the same way. It's very similar to like the prequel trilogy of Star Wars. There are a lot of good things about The Phantom Menace. There's a lot of things that you you can't defend about that movie. But this movie is more akin to Empire Strikes Back. It's more akin to Attack of the Clones. In fact, you know, it came out the year after Attack of the Clones. So I think they're very kind of tied together in some ways for being the middle part of a, of, of a trilogy, for being uh, heavy in philosophy, talking about war, but also audience reaction. I think the audience reaction to Attack of the Clones wasn't great in 2002, but I think over time, as people watched it more, as they were able to contemplate what it was that Lucas was trying to say, maybe they had a better fundamental understanding of it the more they were able to let it marinate. And I think the same thing goes for this. I understand the philosophy, the philosophy, the ideals that they're pushing more now than I did when I was 21. Because when I was 21, what did I want to see? I wanted the action. I wanted the horniness, you know, I was 21, but I'm 41 now. And I'm like, I like the philosophy and I like the horniness, but I like the philosophy. I like the ideas, the, the, the discussion about power, control, cause and effect. What is fate? What is not? And the movie does a great way of kind of blending those together. And it's a narrative that is split across two films. And so while this movie did, you know, not do as well, you could argue cinema score wise, if you want to believe those metrics, it did outperform its predecessor by nearly $300 million in the worldwide box office. And it did get a 74% on Rotten Tomatoes, but it also had the Animatrix to kind of lead into it. And then it had the video game Enter the Matrix, which they shot scenes for that with Nairobi, played by Jada Pinkett Smith, alongside filming the movie. They wanted to create this multimedia approach to the Matrix in such a way that it would allow you to get more of the story depending on the medium of which you got it. Well, holy crap, folks, Marvel did that a couple years later and they were super successful. What happened with the Matrix? Well, Marvel chose to do it with films, with each movie in its you know phases being just one chapter of an overall story. Think of it like a TV show, right? Uh, the pilot episode was Iron Man. The season finale was Endgame. Think of it like that if you haven't thought about it like that before. But this movie was trying to pull in all of these things, expand the lore while also not making it a prerequisite. And I, and I think like I, the problem there is like people get mad if you try to, if you try to give them homework, you know, but I think sometimes homework is necessary. There is lore to the matrix movies that I like, and I'd like to know more about. In fact, I'm probably going to go find some videos on YouTube that break them down because that's a good place for me to get a better understanding of this universe that I think is awesome, that I love, that I'm looking forward to spending more time with for two more films. And I've added the Animatrix to my list of movies to cover. So yes, that will be coming as well. So we're going to have a lot of Matrix here on Patio Commentary. I did put out the voicemail line, 323-400-4956, for anyone who wanted to call in and give their thoughts on the movie. Sadly, this is one that didn't get anything. And that's okay. Maybe Matrix Revolutions will. If not, we'll keep moving forward. Patio commentary is about the discussion, about my experiences, but obviously we're not there yet for getting everybody involved. And that's totally fine. I hope you listen to this and I hope you go, man, I have thoughts. 
Then come find me on Twitter at Podio Commentary, P-O-D-I-O Commentary. You can find me on YouTube at the same name. Uh, and then uh, I'm in a, I'm working on a website. So we'll get something like that up and running for, for more of a, of, of a hub of all things Podio Commentary. Again, if you guys want to support a show and you want to have me cover a movie of your choosing, patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo is the best way to do that. In the meantime, look forward to my thoughts and opinions on Matrix Revolutions coming later this week. Have yourself a great day. Thank you again and peace out.